Audrey Spaulding. I work for the Show Me Institute, and I'm moderating tonight. Uh, we are debating whether libertarians and conservatives are should align themselves for better success. Arguing in the affirmative is David Stokes, our policy analyst, and uh, also Republican committee member of uh, the Clayton County Clayton Township, Clayton Township uh, Republican Committee, <laughs> and. Uh, John Payne, who is currently the state chair of Young Americans for Liberty, so he's a little more libertarian minded. Um, today, uh, David will start with a four minute opening statement, and then John will respond with a four minute opening statement. They'll each ask each other a few questions. I might chip in with a question, but then we'll open it up so that the rest of you can ask questions. So um, let's get started. Thank you, Audrey. I apologize in advance for the actual prepared opening statement, but I assure you it's the only thing I prepared for tonight. No, no worry about that. All right, uh, a 2009 poll for the left-leaning Center for American Progress states, and I have the poll here, that exactly 0% of Americans describe themselves as very libertarian. Now that doesn't mean there are no very libertarian people, of course. It just means that according to this poll, and I make no I make no guarantees to the accuracy of it. It's less than a half of 1%. According to the same poll, about 2% describe themselves as somewhat libertarian. I, I might fall into that category right, right there. And this is all small L, of course, not party related. Now the point of this is to wonder, like, what is the point of everything we're doing? If you're here tonight, you're probably, to some degree, a political activist. Maybe you're extremely active. Maybe it's a Maybe it's a little more interest in something you do in your time, but you're clearly involved. You wouldn't be here otherwise. So what's the point of your, of your involvement? Is, to, is it to achieve something real, to, to fight back against the slide towards statism that we seem to be going more and more towards? Or is it to, is your point to have your beliefs and to focus on being true to your beliefs and, uh, and staying true to them no matter what? It's a legitimate debate, it's a legitimate goal. I, I fall to the former. I fall in wanting to achieve something real. And I'm not, I'm not going to say here, and that conservatives, Republicans, which I'll mostly use interchangeably tonight, I'm not going to say that they've achieved many of these goals that most of us here probably agree on lately. And particularly the spending over the past decade out of Washington. But, now I'll find my place here. But you can attempt to dream and to focus on, um, on your dislike of certain conservative aspects. You can attempt to dream of a very small few, I guess a so-called liberal-tarianism, and side with li liberals and the preposterous notion that people who believe in reducing the size of government in our lives can somehow meaningfully work with people who actively believe in expanding the role of government in all our lives, as if that has a, a chance of success. Or you can try and work with a group of people, a significant group of people, who at least at some core level believes in the limited role of government in our lives. For all the disagreements you may have and, and specific, specific problems, many of which I would agree with libertarians on, you at least have that in common with the greater conservative movement. Like it or not, the history of movements in this country is one where the successful ones achieve their goals largely through politics and generally only after being co-opted by one of the two existing parties. I'm referring here to populists, I'm referring here to the progressive movement, both of which were eventually co-opted by one of the two major parties. And it applies as well to the burgeoning Tea Party movement, which I'm not making any statement about our Tea Party's really Republican, I'm not talking about that as much as saying that eventually the history of American political movement shows that it will. If it's going to succeed, it will. And it could prove me wrong. I would propose even the civil rights movement, which was not really co-opted by one of the parties, achieved its goal through political ends. It achieved its goal with the passing of constitutional amendments. I have no intention, as I said earlier, of defending the spending records of Republicans, conservatives over the past decade nationally. They're indefensible. And I understand that nationally there are many other areas of true disagreement. We've got foreign policy disagreements and the like. But Republicans have a much better record at the state level in many, many states, including Missouri, Republicans and conservatives. At the state and local level in Missouri, I can give plenty of examples of successful Republicans and conservatives holding the line on spending and the growth of government and intrusion. Libertarians can align with these types of Republicans. And the exceptions, of course, drug laws in the state, I know would be a strong area of disagreement, 
and there are other exceptions. But the size of Missouri government has decreased in real terms since the GOP took the legislature in 2002. It, the number of state, of state employees declined in the Blunt administration. And, and we had a decent economy at that time. Governor Nixon and Governor Blunt both deserve credit along with the legislature for some of these achievements. Locally, St. Charles is dominated by the GOP and has seen great economic growth in that county with low taxes, limited role of government, very limited use of TIF, no eminent domain abuse in the county part, and more. Finally, I urge libertarians to work with conservatives and Republicans out of selfish reasons. I want the present GOP to be more libertarian. I do. I'm sorry for the slip there. I want libertarians to realize that Woody Allen was correct when he said that the world is run by the people who show up. That includes party politics. People can get active in the St. Louis or the Missouri GOP like the many Ron Paul supporters who have become very active in the St. Louis City Republican Party. Moving the GOP in Missouri and the conservative movement in Missouri, moving it in a more libertarian direction is not a pipe dream. It is a legitimate and achievable goal. Not one where you, you as libertarians would certainly get everything you wanted, but it's a strategy where you could achieve at least some of what you passionately believe in. And if that is what you're really about, the, people, the other people talking tonight, the people participating, if you're really about achieving something, if you're about just being good to your, to your core, well, that's fine, but, but you're, you're wasting everybody else's time at that point. I'm done. Okay, well, thank you. Um, and now for John's opening statement. All right, so to start off with, I, I gotta say that uh, you know, Stokes and I actually agree on most things, and uh, if all conservatives believed what Stokes believes, then I probably wouldn't, we probably wouldn't be here having this conversation tonight, because I would pretty much agree with them, with them on most things, but that's simply not the case. Uh, and I think that Stokes' argument is uh, long on theory and short on data. I think uh, the fact is, is that uh, I think everyone recognizes that conservatives are worse from a libertarian perspective than liberals on, say, social policy and foreign policy. They want a more active government in those spheres. No one really disputes that. Uh, I'm going to make the case that they are also only marginally, if, if even marginally, better than, uh, than liberals and Democrats in the economic sphere. Uh, first uh, first uh, data point in that would be the George W. Bush years. Uh, six of those were united government, Republicans controlled both houses of Congress and the presidency. They could have, uh, if they really wanted to limit the size of government, this was their golden opportunity to. Instead, uh, spending grew faster in the Bush administration for those years, faster than any uh, administration since the Roosevelt administration. They were actually, uh, it was rising at 2.4% of GDP per year. Uh, that is that's a pretty atrocious uh, level of spending. Uh, according to Veronique Duruji of the Mercatus Center, Bush increased the federal budget uh, by 104% in the eight years compared to 11% uh, by Bill Clinton. So Bill Clinton, who had six years of divided government uh, with the Republicans controlling the legislature and him controlling the presidency, he, d he uh, only increased the government by about a tenth of what Bush did. So it seems like divided government might be the way to go in, this, in these cases. Uh, and the Republicans that are in power today are no better. Uh, for instance, uh, 34 Republicans and in the Senate and 91 in the House voted for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, the bailout of all the, uh, of all the banks. Uh, and this is something that they just spent hundreds of billions of dollars on, and most of them are pretty unrepentant about that, uh, except for the fact that now they're kind of running against it and saying we should uh, go back. Well, it's too late. Uh, included in that is, let's see, the Senate, the both House and Senate Minority Leaders, John Boehner, Mitch McConnell respectively, and both whips, Eric Cantor and Missouri's own Roy Blunt. Uh, even supposed super fiscal conservative Paul Ryan voted for the TARP bailout. Uh, furthermore, Paul Ryan's Roadmap for America, which is supposed to be considered one of the better, uh, better fiscally conservative plans out there, won't balance the budget until 2063, 50 years from now, and yet this is considered very extreme for anyone in the Republican Party. So they don't even have any intention of balancing the budget for another 50 years. And that's, you know, Paul Ryan's a radical for even proposing that. 
So I think that just shows you how unworkable the modern Republican Party is. Um, then when they were discussing, uh, John Boehner was on Fox News this past Sunday discussing the new Pledge to America from the Republican Party. Uh, he could not name a specific program that he would want to cut to uh, start bringing down spending. Furthermore, uh, yeah, you, hold on. Okay, Newt Gingrich also would not give any specifics about these plans. Uh, then John Cornyn of Texas, when I went, he said that uh, you know the Republicans aren't prepared to make any hard choices. And also, he uh, when Obama, the Obama administration attempted to cut 3.8 billion dollars from NASA's funding, you know something that he should supposedly be in favor of. Cornyn went and defended it because where does NASA funding go? Texas, which is where Cornyn's a state uh, senator from. So when it actually comes for, to their interests, they have no no interest in cutting government whatsoever. In fact, mainly what uh, Newt Gingrich, supposedly one of the brains behind the Republican Revolution of 1994, when uh, what he does mostly now is talk about ways that he can restrict the religious and property rights of, uh, of Muslims in lower Manhattan. That's, that's all he's about today, these days. It's not about limiting the size of government. Uh, this actually extends even to the Tea Party. A poll was released just today that showed that despite all their free market rhetoric, the Tea Party opposes free trade. They say they believe that free trade has hurt America. By 61% uh, of them claim that. That compares to 65% of union members. It, you know, there's basically no one more anti-free trade than union members, except almost the Tea Party. Clearly, these this is not a workable alliance if you care about free markets. Uh, Furthermore, I do believe that uh, we should focus more on social issues in many cases because, uh, actually, looks like I'm running low on time. I'll get, I'll get to this point in my closing statement. But So what I'm advocating is not an alliance with uh, Democrats or liberals. Uh, it may, you might form strategic alliances for specific issues, but I don't think there's a good long-term alliance out there for, for libertarians. Uh, what I think we have to do is hope for gridlock. Vote against whatever party is in power and try to fill up Congress with the opposition party. That's historically what has led to maybe not a uh, less government, but at least a slowdown of the growth of government. Uh, I think that's the best best route we have. Thank you. So, so you're saying everybody should vote Republican this November? <laughs> well, it would, I am hoping for a big Republican victory in November, yes. I will not deny that. Perfect. So, um, thanks for your opening statement. Now we're going to have uh, the debaters ask each other a few questions. So, Stokes, what's your first question for John? I have some, got a number of them here. I'm delighted. Thank you, Audrey. <laughs> All right, John. Please name me one truly successful libertarian, capital L, capital L, political achievement where they did not work with another party. In 20th century, don't say the American Revolution. Well, it might be a correct, that could be possibly a correct answer. Do you mean something that the Libertarian something, Party... The Libertarian Party and the Libertarian Movement. Well, like an actual successful political achievement. And before anybody snaps at me, I will admit that there's a paucity of conservative political achievements over the past half decade, too, as we go further and further into an area neither of us wants to go to. Well, I would say probably the uh, biggest achievement for libertarians in the uh, 20th century, well, was the latter half, was uh, the ending of the draft during Vietnam. And it was largely accomplished by, uh, you know, they held hearings on it. And it wasn't, obviously, there was a lot of the uh, fact that it was becoming very difficult to draft young men to go over to Vietnam. But uh, Milton Friedman's testimony before Congress had a large effect on that. And, uh, you know, General Westmoreland, who had been the commander in chief, or not commander, the commander of U.S. troops in Vietnam uh, asked him, well, if we just had a volunteer army, we would have mercenary soldiers. And then Friedman told him, well, yes, and we have mercenary butchers and mercenary bakers, but it all works out fine. Uh, so that was probably the biggest achievement of, uh, of libertarians in the 20th century. And I don't know how much uh, support these people were getting from the major party structures, either one of them because the Democratic Party was pretty gung-ho about the Vietnam War just as much as the Republican Party was, so. Well, that's a, that's a very good answer. I, I think that the, the, the student, left-wing student movements and the liberal wing of the Democratic Party would claim that they also had a major role to play in, no doubt. in the ending of the draft. No doubt. That, would, that, would, that might be one of your strategic alliances, but I 
and certainly that I think it's much more an example of the libertarians working with a party organization on that. I, I definitely worked with a lot of people who were liberals, but I don't know if you would call it a party organization, at least compared to what the the political parties back then were not, or at least the Democratic Party was, the people who ran it were still very hostile with that sort of idea. I mean, it was, that was back when, you know, the AFL-CIO basically ran the Democratic Party with an iron fist up until 72. So. Um, okay, so John, what is your question for Stokes? What's your first one? Okay, uh, so you mentioned that I didn't get to get into uh, much of the stuff about the states, but uh, at the state level, you said that you know it's usually Republicans that are controlling, uh, keeping budgets down. But wouldn't you agree that also uh, states where there's a divided government uh, do just as well in that? Uh, for instance, Missouri right now under Nixon, and uh, perhaps best of all, uh, Chris Christie in New Jersey at the Democratic legislature there. They've been they have a huge, huge fiscal problem, but they're actually you know, passing it as opposed to say out in uh, California. Schwarzenegger is a, is a Republican, but that's sort of a misnomer, I think. <laughs> well, yes, I'm also a fan of divided government. Good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't think anybody here would dispute that good, bad things happen less often when you have divided government. So I'll concede that point happily. And I pray that we have divided government here in about five weeks. I don't know about your New Jersey example. I'll, you're certainly correct in Missouri. Governor Nixon is naturally a very modern politician is, is working with a Republican dominated legislature he uh, he doesn't it's it's fair to say he doesn't have that much leeway I mean at least the state Senate could is so Republican it, it's now fighting among itself it's so Republican that's a good example of divided government I would propose New Jersey is much is more an example of the current Republican governor winning I don't think that the Democrats in the legislature are many of them are working with him as much as they're losing because he's winning the, the war in public opinion and he's <coughs> sustaining vetoes by the slimmest of margins because he has just another, enough Republican votes in that legislature. And he's wielding the veto very effectively. Like Gary Johnson, who some of us heard in Cleveland, talking about when he was governor of New Mexico. So I've, in, in, in the answer to your question is yes, I'm a fan of divided government. Never, com never complain about it. And there are certainly examples where it's working great. And Missouri is clearly right now one of them. Meeting. Meeting you. All right. Now, no more gotcha questions. It's just about, let's have a conversation here. I think you'll like these. Who are some of the, as a libertarian, as a staunch libertarian, the less than half of 1% from the poll, I'm not saying it's accurate, who are some of the major political figures since World War II of either, of either party, the major political figures that you admire and that would have and would have, had you lived in that time and place, would have actively gone out and supported, would have worked for. Like, I believe in, in this person. Uh, and take a moment, we're in no rush. Take, okay. It's certainly a wide question. Take a few moments to think about it. I would not have that answer off the tip of my tongue. I would uh, say first, probably. I'll get a beer while you think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I can uh, do this on, on my feet. But the first one that comes to mind is probably Robert Taft who ran against Dwight Eisenhower for the Republican uh, nomination for president in 1952. Uh, you know, he was adamantly opposed to joining the UN. He was opposed to the Korean War, basically thought it was the beginning of America turning into an empire. Uh, he wasn't, uh, he was fiscally conservative, maybe not quite as much as I would have liked, but uh, I think it would have been a dramatic change from what we ended up with. Uh, the, if the Republican Party had been dominated by the Taft run, I think you don't get nearly as much uh, foreign interventionism, which I think has, you know, if you look at the federal budget, the biggest things are Medicare, Social Security, and military spending. And basically, if we didn't have a globe-straddling foreign policy, uh, which we probably wouldn't have uh, if Taft, if at least the Republicans had opposed the sort of liberal internationalism of the Democrats with uh, some kind of no, let's protect our own borders first, then I think we would have much less spending on, on uh, defense and probably less government all around. Uh, I don't know if I could have actually brought myself to vote for Goldwater uh, based up exactly upon that objection because he was quite willing to you know, blow up the world if it came down to it against the Russians. Uh, you know, but other than that, uh, I, 
I do think Goldwater is very good. I probably could have, I might have at least worked for him. Uh, whether I could have voted for him in the end or not, I don't know. Um, I would say, obviously, I'm a, a fan of Ron Paul. I don't know, does he count as a major political figure? Yes, yes, okay. he's a member of the United States Congress. Okay, well then, yes. Uh, I, I, you know, I did go out and campaign for Ron Paul in 2007 and 8, and uh, also voted for him in the primaries. So, yeah, I, uh, and if he runs again, I'll probably do the same. And Gary Johnson, if he runs, I, I would actually prefer him, because Ron Paul's getting pretty old, but. He's a very fiscally conservative guy with some socially liberal policies, and I, yeah, I could, uh, I could easily vote for him. I have a follow-up question. What uh, you just named four people? What party did all four of those people belong to? <laughs> they were all Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that, you know, two of uh, Ron Paul's a libertarian. Well, well, he yes, he did run as a libertarian in 1988. Uh, a member of Congress is a member of the Republican Party. And also, two of them have, you know, the, they were they ran for president. 58 and uh, 42 years, or and 46 years ago. Uh, so it's been quite a while, and you know, Goldwater still embraced somewhat. But when's the last time you've heard the name Robert Taft at a Republican meeting? Uh, when his know. grandson went to prison. Okay, yeah, there you go. Uh, and I, I don't think he actually went to prison. He was convicted of a crime as governor of Ohio. But he did not go to prison. But, and Ron Paul is so uh, so disliked by his own party that you know he's. The party has backed challengers to him in, the, in his district. So we are talking about people who would not have much of a home in the modern Republican Party, for the most part. It was a great answer. I disagree with the very last statement there. Okay. That, that terrific answer. Question for Steph? Yeah, sure. Uh, so do you believe that conservatives want to cover, cut government out of most areas or all areas of life? I believe that most conservatives do want to cut government, yes. I believe the reasons for its failure this is, a t is largely, much of which has to do with the standard reasons espoused in public choice economics that we both understand and subscribe to. Um, there's a lot of cut it there, cut it there, cut it there. Oh, don't cut it there. That one affects me. And that when you put that into the political realm, where every, every U.S. senator has the filibuster and one thing they're passionate to protect, it becomes very difficult to cut government. I do believe, I'd like to see, I, I don't know the answer to how you succeed in doing it because the political problems facing it are so tough. Perhaps it's simply just one of finally getting some type of conservative majority and putting some sort of massive cuts forward without allowing any changes. That will probably never happen. The realistic objection is probably fiscal crisis which will necessitate it, unfortunately. I do. I know a lot of conservative Republicans, the overwhelming majority of them, want to cut government in many ways out of our lives, at the national level, at the state level, at the local level, things I'll be happy to get into earlier or later, the constant regulation we face in our lives, the nanny state, the, the, uh, the taxation to support the welfare state. Most conservatives I know want to cut government are many of them very willing to make an exception or two to something that may benefit them, and does that make the entire process extremely difficult to achieve? Yes. Can we do the third question? I think I'm, I have a third one for him that's a good one, and it relates to what we were just talking about. It'll be real quick. It will be real, and it's a quick question and a quick answer. All right, Rand Paul is, as I understand it, the Kentucky Libertarian Party, again, we're to the party, not libertarian, is not supporting Rand Paul to the United States Senate. I could be wrong, some things could be I think you're correct. If you live in Kentucky, right here, right now, would you be supporting the campaign of Rand Paul, probably the most libertarian leading candidate with a realistic chance of winning a Senate seat in decades, if not, if not ever? Probably so, uh, but I do have uh, some reservations not about, uh, uh, I thought he was actually very good in the primaries, and now I think he's, uh, you know, he was actually more libertarian in the primaries, and now has become a little more centrist, and it worries me that he is, uh, you know, meeting with uh, a lot of the conservative intellectuals that, you know, he uh, used to be condemning. And I worry that he's uh, going to possibly become more and more run of the mill Republican as time goes on because I've already seen him drift quite a bit from uh, where he was 
when he was campaigning for his father three years ago. So, yes, with reservations. And, uh, you yeah, know, he may very well end up breaking my heart. So. <laughs> well, thanks. Good answer and yes. I will say that I've, I've never in my life voted for somebody that I agree with on that. It's just not something that you're ever you're ever going to get. And that's not to say that people I, it's not to saying it was always the least bad option. There's people I strongly support and believe in, but I never agreed with them on everything. I expect it will never, never happen. I wasn't 18 to vote for Reagan. Maybe if I'd have been 18 at that point, that would have been a yes. Um, I actually have a question for John. Um, I know that you spoke about this idea of divided government being really the solution, that uh, under President Clinton we had government spending growth of only 11%. I would say that's not enough. You know, if we're still growing at 11% every eight years, you know, we're having constantly encroaching government. And I'm wondering if you can envision even a um, alliance or a party coming into power and actually making government growth Go negative. Well, actually, it should be emphasized that that is uh, just total total figures there. As a percentage of GDP, uh, the government actually shrank under Clinton by I think it was let's see, 0.6 percent every year. So uh, that's that is some shrinking of the government. That's something. Uh, but yeah, in constant dollar terms, it's still more 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 dollars. But as a percentage of GDP, government did shrink. Uh, so. Yes, I can envision something like that happening, and I don't think it necessarily has to come about through either one of the major parties. It can come about through both if, you know, there's, I, I do think you have to get involved in some way, uh, but if people with more libertarian ideas push each party at the margin to be more libertarian, then we can have more libertarian results. Uh, this is sort of the pattern, uh, the, there was a group called the Mugwumps back in the 19th century. So they were Republicans, but they bolted the party in 1888 to vote for uh, vote for Grover Cleveland, who was a Democrat, and probably one of the most libertarian uh, libertarian presidents we've ever had. If if I had been asked the question, could you know go back in the 19th century, Grover Cleveland would have probably topped the list. Uh, but very strict constitutionalist, believed in the gold standards, all that sort of stuff, and uh, he. Uh, he, was, he won, basically, because these Republicans ditched the Republican Party and voted for him. And so I think the Libertarians should uh, learn a lot from that and try to emulate them, you know, strategic disloyalty, basically. Uh, be the swing vote. Decide who is, uh, make the decision as to who will actually win and make them cater to you. Because if you stick with one party, well, then they know that they can do whatever they want without actually punishing, without repercussions. Little known fact, the, uh, the city of Cleveland is not actually named for Grover Cleveland, but the small Missouri town of Grover is. <laughs> Most people don't know that. Um, my, my question for you, I know that you stress you know, that libertarians should align themselves with conservatives, with Republicans. I guess I really have a two-part question. The first is, if I'm a libertarian and social issues are more important to me, why not align myself with Democrats? If I, if I fundamentally believe that my right to marry whomever I choose is more important than, say, spending, why not go for the Democratic uh, alliance? And then my second question is, um, how would you, coming from your perspective of your involvement with the Republican Party, how would you uh, convert uh, Republicans to being more for limited government in the realm of social issues? Can I answer the second one first? Because I think I, have a, I, have, I, think I do have a an easier answer to that. I think that answer is time. And what I mean by time is I think it's happening with, with, with generational change. I think it's happening rather over the next decade or so. It will happen rather dramatically and, and uh, somewhat easily. I think that many of these changes, if you as a libertarian would want to see, I think that many younger people of all parties are agreeing with that. And as they grow, those things will those beliefs will come with them, whether they be Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, or whatever. And I think that a lot of these social changes, many of which I don't agree with you on, but I think they're clearly going to happen, and they're probably going to happen sooner rather than later, because it just takes a little flip in the electorate. You don't have to get to 100 percent. As people grow, and more voters, and the older people, older voters, move on, to put it politely. I think you're going to see those changes come. It's going to be a 
It's going to happen without much controversy at all, but it'll just happen. First, first part, first one's tougher. I think uh, I know. I probably actually do know a lot of libertarians because of where I work. Uh, many of them that I, I know do focus on fiscal issues. The fiscal issues are of pretty great importance to them. Uh, certainly, the last person to put words in the mouth of a libertarian because I am not one. But uh, it's a for the subsection of libertarians from social issues are the, the dominant aspect. I think you, I see your point to aligning with the, the Democrats. I, uh, I think a point that I've actually got it written down here. You can, you can check me out on that. The point I wanted to make later is it's a, a lot of people turn it to say abortion, uh, gay marriage. These are a few social issues that libertarians agree with liberals or Democrats on so they turn. Well, I'll, I'll turn it on you if I may answer a question with a question, which isn't always polite, but what about the, just the myriad of other less well-known social issues where liberals and kind of push in all their lives? Do they, do they helmet laws or, or the nanny state or, or health care, health care food restrictions? We can't, we've got everything right here. We can't have bake sales anymore in, in St. Louis. Can, do you know that? Because Paris can no longer have a bake sale because you can't bring prepared food, food prepared elsewhere into a city and then sell it or give it away. I mean, there's just, there's, I've got more ri written down on here. What? A land use rules, restriction of occupational licensing. And the list goes, goes on and on of, of social issue type things, of restrictions in how we live our lives, where liberals, and in many cases, really more the bureaucracy built by government, of government of all part, where they impose these regulations on our lives day to day. And sure, the, the big ones that you named, gay marriage, abortion. I did not name abortion. You did, but the, okay, the many that many people do name, sure. That aligns with the, the Democrats. But for many of these other smaller type social freedom issues, I would, I would state that I think libertarians actually are gonna find allies on many of them only in the conservative party. I mean, unless, unless you think you can trust liberals and Democrats to try and rein in the bureaucracy. Which is a, if you think you can do that, good luck. Well, I wish you all the luck in the world. Yeah, I think I, I, I mean, I, I think you raised some good points. I think another good point is just how effective have Democrats been in advancing some of those social issues in recent memory. I think I think you can make the case you know, on issues of eminent domain, on don't ask, don't tell, on gay marriage. You know, there's a long way to go. Um, okay, so we'll open it up for questions. Uh, okay, yes, you in the back. Could you actually answer this question about gay marriage? And uh, abortion. Is that a question? John Payne? Oh. Yeah, basically the. No, 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 no. no. The, uh, her question? I mean, like, no, no, no. I mean, like, when she asked about the. Uh, <laughs> how, how would you respond about gay marriage and abortion? I mean, you answered the question. Well, can we, can we actually. I did answer, answer, answer the question. I think I understand how liber libertarians who focus on that would align themselves with the Democratic Party. That's my answer. What you're going to do, I understand why you might want to choose to do that. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, for, the Richard. Uh, for Mr. Payne, um, I, as an ex libertarian uh, who joined the Republican Party, what I found was that when I talked with, when I was a libertarian talking to people, no one cared. When I was a Republican talking to people, people cared. How would you? change libertarian party so that they can get the audience to, to get your views across. It's no good having a view if you're in a vacuum. But if you're with a group and you can say, listen, you're, I agree with you on this, but you're a little wrong on that, they'll listen to you. But as a libertarian, you have no audience. Well, I'm not sure, uh, you know, I'm not a big believer in the libertarian party per se. I uh, did do some work with them uh, when I was in college and I'm not opposed to working with them, but I, I don't think it's going to be the most productive route uh, to advancing a libertarian agenda. So, but I will say that at least if you're trying to change people's minds, sometimes the the unknown label of libertarian can actually be an advantage, because as opposed to all the biases and uh, prejudices people have against either of the two main parties, if they haven't heard of, of libertarian, well, they might be more open to hearing the ideas. Uh, so, but people are, I will say, if they're just interested in politics, of just, you know, the horse race kind of stuff, then yeah, they're not going to really care because, you know, libertarians aren't 
typically don't uh, think about that so much. And maybe that is a failing. Maybe the, they, if they want to really have an impact, they need to think about day-to-day -day politics more. But nonetheless, you know, it's not just about that for libertarians. It's obviously about a very central core of ideas. And if you want to advance those, I think in the long run, what you have to do is you have to change people's minds about them. And so it kind of helps that libertarianism is not a well-known philosophy, I think, because people don't have so many, as many assumptions about Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, you and the red shirt in the back. Sure. The Sloan Ranger. Someone who's rising <laughs> to ask a question. I think you guys both did a great job of proving each other in effect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we clearly see the, the difference being libertarians are ineffective when they don't get elected and Republicans ineffective when they do. So there's a distinction. Maybe there's an alliance there, maybe not. What I would challenge both and Maybe I missed it, but you know, we need a vision out there for how we can succeed. Uh, very dangerous times. I've lived a long time and I've, I've just seen the government grow. And I've had hopes that it would train. But we're getting to really crunch time now, I think, and some, some debt's going to crash down on all of us. It may, not, it may not wither away, as Marsh described. The state rarely does that. It may turn really ugly here in the next decade or so model like the French Revolution or even the, the German rise of fascism. And I think really what's your vision to actually get something, something that will shrink this government? Is it the Tea Parties? Do we infiltrate both parties? I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well Lloyd, I guess I guess I didn't provide much of a vision earlier because I like you am essentially pessimistic. I think the government grows and grows and as bad as it was first part of this decade, now all of a sudden it's, it's even worse than the, the, past, the past two years. I think uh, issues of, of safety, of people constantly wanting the government to, to get into, to protect every aspect of our lives, and that, that's not an extremist thing, that's the, the moderates, the middle, the middle of America is just totally buying into the role that the government should have a role to play in protecting us from all sorts of things. Be it, be it an overreaction to crime. I, I agree on, on changing our nation's drug laws. I think that's one thing I actually am optimistic on over time as, as the generations change. My vision as a pessimist to how it can happen, unfortunately, I think fiscal crisis might be the only way that it does happen. I certainly don't want that to happen. But I guess I do have, I have hope that organizations like book clubs, like our book club, will reach, reach enough kids and reach enough young people to get out there changing minds. I have hope uh, for, for that. Um, hope is the best way I can probably put it. That's not to, to, to put all the efforts of what we're doing there down. But, but um, really, I think there's a significant amount of the population of America now that it's just, be it, be it Medicare, or Medicaid, Social Security, unemployment, welfare, are gigantic an expanding welfare state, our government employment, and I used to work for the government, I'm not pure of, of heart here, but people actively involved in government employment who have um, an active role in, in the benefits of the government that I don't have a lot of optimism for shrinking the size of government in our lives. I see at the local and state level, I've seen Republicans, sometimes working with conservatives, like here in Missouri, of um, succeeding in doing it. But I think that's the exception rather than the rule. Well, I think uh, we're probably in something of agreement here. I think I'm more optimistic, but uh, it's I do think that probably nothing is going to change until we hit some kind of major crisis. And I can also see that that crisis may very well be coming in the relatively near future, probably 10, 20 years. Uh, but the thing is, is that nothing ever really changes without that crisis. So, you know. We can take advantage of that too. Uh, you know, the, there's a very stupid book called The Shock Doctrine, written by Naomi Klein, which basically says this is what free market types do: is just wait for crisis and then impose our uh, impose our will upon the people. That's not really accurate. In fact, most of the time when there's a crisis, the government grows. But it is possible to shrink the government in the time of crisis as well. Uh, so, if we can get to, uh, you know, it doesn't take a majority of the people; it just takes a lot of people that are very dedicated, 10, 20% even, 
can make a dramatic difference if if you basically have very few options. If the options are, well, crushing tax rates, or government default, or we cut spending a lot, you know, uh, and I think two of those are actually fairly liber libertarian options. The government defaults, I don't care. It's uh, yeah. you know, don't hold government bonds. That's what you get. <laughs> but anyway, so. Uh, if, if one of those two things happens, then we can we can start talking about retrenchment of the government. But it's not you're only going to be probably changing around the margins until something like that happens. You just got to worry though when that crisis hits, do we uh, go the other direction and basically end up you know some kind of horrible totalitarian state? John, Who knows? <laughs> John's description of our three options there reminds me of the former Ohio State football coach Woody Hayes' views on the forward pass which was famously said, three things can happen and two of them are bad. <laughs> okay, uh, does anyone else have another question? Uh, yes, you in the middle. So, this is John. Um, when you were going through your opening statement, you mentioned conserv you were using the party and conservatives interchangeably. Um, but don't you think there are plenty of Republicans out there that are really Republicans in name only? People who are just getting elected because you know they were slightly to the right of the, the Democrat and they won the won the race or whatever. I mean, personally, I wouldn't consider George Bush to be a fiscal conservative any more than um, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, that's fair enough, but I mean, he was certainly embraced by the conservatives. I mean, uh, I went to CPAC back, at, uh, which is the Col uh, Conservative Political Action Conference, back in 2004. And you know the, his record already fiscally was just awful, and but you know what? There were thousands of young conservatives waiting to see him. So no, not even see him speak. See Dick Cheney speak on a television monitor, and you know like tears in their eyes over this. Like this was the. That, I mean, it was kind of creepy actually. <laughs> uh, and so you know this is. They certainly believed that conservatives considered him one of their own. Now. Did he adhere to their fiscal policies? No. And a lot of them would admit that. But they would just say that, oh, well, but he has to do it because there's a war on blah, blah, blah. Well, if that's going to be your attitude, you're never going to shrink the government because there will always be some crisis du jour. You know, There's always going to be some sort of crisis for the government to grow and fill that gap. And so even if I, I, I remember writing at the time that George Bush wasn't a conservative because of the fact that, yeah, he didn't. Uh, meet the standards of what it would say and say conscience of a conservative by Barry Goldwater. But the conservatives definitely seem to think that he is one. So by and large they do anyway. So who am I to argue? <laughs> That's not true. I, I think the conservatives knew he wasn't a conservative but he was a damn sight better than the other guy. And, and so um, and one of the reasons Bush's poll numbers were so bad during his presidency is because the conservative wing of the Republican Party abandoned him and said he wasn't doing a good job. I know there was a substantial minority of conservatives that would say that, but I think it was still a minority. Most conservatives were very pro-Bush. Oh, up until, I will say, yeah, probably with the with the TARP bailout, a lot of people did bail on him. Uh, I'll, I'll agree with that. And also on the uh, immigration issue, he lost a lot of popularity with the, also the, the uh, Medicare Part D. Uh, but Medicare Part D, now this, uh, I don't know about the polling of the public that describes themselves as conservatives, but you know, you had, I have it written down here, let's see. Uh, well, basically, uh, almost, I, can't, I don't actually have uh, exact figures, but it was over 200 in the House, Republicans backed him, and over 40 in the Senate. So, I mean, you're talking about the vast, vast majority of the Republican legislators. Conser you know, and some of them obviously were considered very conservative, but they still voted for Medicare Part D. E. Uh, does anyone else have additional questions for our debaters? I want to point out that Congressman Aiken from St. Louis did not vote for Medicare. Hmm. Very good. Good plug. <laughs> I'm just saying, well, it's good. Oh, yes, you in the back. Sorry. Can both, both gentlemen address how they can, how they're parties can cooperate to reduce taxes. <laughs> we'll start? Uh, sure. Uh, I, I have no problem with working with uh, any uh, any group on a single issue as long as obviously they 
uh, we share belief in that issue. So, you know, if uh, I guess one thing we do is work together to, you know, write articles, spread the word about that sort of thing, which Stokes and I do. <laughs> you know, so uh, that's uh, please donate. Yeah, <laughs> that is one thing. Um, I would say. I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I guess actually, if your goal was just to reduce taxes, the Republicans are actually pretty good on that. Or maybe I should say they're very good at delaying taxes mm -hmm. because they're you know they've they'll, they'll cut taxes and then they'll just spend use deficit spending, but eventually that comes due. So you know it's sort of just like a tax uh, upon the future. Uh, to actually cut taxes for the long run, I think you have to reduce spending. So. I think probably the best way to do that is to make sure that no party in government gets too powerful. Uh, that's the be the easiest way without uh, having some sort of real, real huge sea change in public opinion. Uh, well, that's a question that leads to an area that I have, a, and I'll talk about what John just said there. So an area I have some fundamental disagreement with, with John on, where he said. That's an area where we can work together. We have a strategic alliance here, then we move to a strategic alliance elsewhere. And I, I think that that misstates how, how parties work. And I don't mean that, I certainly don't mean that condescendingly at all. What I mean is, a, a few months ago, John and I were having sort of a preliminary discussion to this debate, and John said, if I may quote, I'd give a close paraphrase here, and it wasn't an off the record conversation by any means. He said, I'm happy to work with party when I, within a party when I agree with them, but then if I if I disagree with them on something, I'm gonna back up and say I can't I can't work with you on that. Well that's that's not how parties work and that's not how you succeed. And I'll, what I mean by that is the next time you're in that party and having that internal party debate, you might win the internal party debate as the libertarians like and then you'll turn to the other wing of the party and say, well all right, we just won the debate. Help me help me achieve this goal. And they'll say, well, just last year you abandoned us when you didn't agree with us on a certain, a certain role here. So that's how parties are formed. That's how parties work together. And it's not a pretty thing. It's not even, it's, sometimes it's barely lawful. But you have to work with people who agree with you for the most part. I find myself as a Republican supporting, and this is not show me it's a new day, this is a Republican day. I find myself supporting and working with Upstate Republicans are adamantly in support of ethanol. I despise ethanol. And show me to do, we're, we're probably the leader, the leading ethanol haters of the ethanol subsidy. I don't hate ethanol. I hate the subsidy that we have for it. And yet I find myself supporting these types of people because for the, the bulk of things, I agree with them for the most part. And at the state level especially, I can probably find more successes than failures in what they've done in, in the legislature. So sure, taxes are an easy one. Uh, and they're, they're probably the easiest of, of them all. Because, because there are certainly, when it comes down to how do you cut the spending to, to pay for that tax increase, not that I think tax increases need to be paid for, I think it should be the other way. Libertarians have certainly been better, philosophically, than Republicans on them. There's a lot of Republican failure there. But, but it's, a, it's a hard thing, and that's why you have to work together in the long run. Because it's, it's really the only, hope I think of much success, pessimist that I may be anyway. If I can jump in, can you explain that um, in the context of the Tea Party? I was recently listening to a debate between one of the leaders of the Tea Party um, and a, uh, a conservative gentleman who was saying that the Tea Party needs to take a stance on social issues as a group. And um, the, the leader said, well, no, no, we're just about government spending, right? And so the Tea Party is a new organization their single issue is you know, limiting the growth of government in the financial sector, and yet it seems like um, Republicans of all stripes are paying attention to them. They're having success. They're you know, bending the ears of the right people. Um, how is that different? And they're certainly not really working within the party structure. Well, I don't agree with whichever conservative said that the Tea Party needs to take a stand on social issues. So I would agree with the, the Tea Party spokesperson there who said we're going to they focused on, on fiscal issues. As that their movement, that's that, if that's what they want to focus on, good for them. Um, and I support them in that in that regard. So uh, the Tea Party is a very interesting uh, recent 
recent development. I do have, if there's, two, if there's things that give me hope for political change in this country, that's one of them. That's the primary one, probably. I'd like, I, I, I know some Tea Party members are truly dedicated to the, to the idea of reducing government. I fear some of them are strictly, don't cut my Medicare, you know, the, that type of thing. For the most part, I think it's a great movement. I've been to a few Tea Party rallies, know a lot of the St. Louis leaders of the Tea Party, I think, think, they're, think they're great. Um, have, have hope for it. Expect that if it succeeds in the long run, it will, it will be co-opted into the Republican Party, but it might be co-opted in a good way, meaning that the Tea Party goals, in a sense, the Tea Party might co-opt the Republican Party. And if they co-opt the Republican Party to a message of fiscal discipline, I'd, I'd love to see that. And that's, and that's an area where if you want to be a successful party, if you want to achieve your goals, then socially conservative Republicans and fiscally conservative Tea Party activists are going to have to work together to get to that level where they can achieve things. And I hope that they do. And uh, I hope that answers the question. But they're not really operating currently within party structure. They're well, no, and that's a, that's a good thing. And that's a, that's a, it's, the Tea Party, I think, to find parallels, you've got to go back to the populists, to the progressives, to, to other political movements. I don't think it's something we've seen too recently in American political history. And I don't have no, I do not claim to have any idea how it's going to turn out. I hope that the message of, their message of fiscal discipline takes over the Republican Party, that it becomes the dominant message of, of the GOP. Will it? I have, I have no idea. I hope, I hope it does. And there's nothing wrong with them operating outside of the party. In Missouri, with our open primary registration, it's particularly easy for them to operate outside the party because the day before the election, they can go and they can pull the Democratic ballot, they can pull the Republican ballot, whichever they want. It's a, it's a little harder maybe in other states to operate outside of that the party due to the voter rules. Uh, yes. Um, I have actually heard some things um, uh, some speculation that the Republican Party might actually split, that if, you know, there'll be a concert, like a socially conservative Republican Party or a fiscally conservative Republican Party. I mean, do you see that as something that is actually going to happen or is this sort of just, you know, kind of a social thing that we're seeing generally in the Republican Party that's not gonna, you know, um, solidify into anything? What do, you, what do you think about that? I don't think it's, it's gonna split. I think that the, the two-party system in the country is uh, too strong, for better or worse. I happen to think it's probably you know, as much as I it, probably for the better. But uh, I think a lot of people here would disagree with me on that. But uh, whether you agree with it or not, I think the two-party system is is here to stay, and I think the Tea Party movement will uh, eventually co-op or be co-opted, and social conservatives are going to. Have to have to deal with that, and I predict they'll deal with it by eventually. You'll get a Reagan figure who comes to the forefront that can unite all the wings of the party in a way that we don't seem to have right now. I have no idea who that will be, by the way. I'll, uh, I'll agree with Stokes on that one. I don't think it's actually going to split, but I think there is already a pretty big split within the party uh, based on geography. Uh, if you look at the South, it's pretty much. That, that's the social conservative wing. And if you go out west, that's the more libertarian wing, pretty much. I mean, there, there are other splits to be had, but you know, if you look at basically the difference between uh, people voting for Mike Huckabee versus, say, uh, you know, Ron Paul never had that huge totals, but I think he got like 30% in Montana, you know, and 28% in Nevada. So, I mean, those are, for him, very big numbers. Out west, the libertarian, more libertarian Republicans are very popular. Down in the south, no, not in any way. So uh, the, I think there is a big ge geographic split among the Republican Party. I don't think it will actually end up causing the party to actually fracture. I just have to disagree with the point there. I mean, Rand Paul is from Texas, and Rand Paul is on the ballot in Kentucky. Kentucky, and there's a Georgia congressman whose name is escaping me, unfortunately. Who won a special election to Congress? Paul Broon. Paul, who was a very similar Ron Paul Republican. Now, I, I, he only won because of the mechanics of a, a special election, but that's from from Georgia. You're certainly right on everything you just said is accurate. 
in the aggregate. So there are exceptions to that, and I just wanted to point those out there. Well, uh, let me just respond very briefly. I mean, Texas, I, I don't know if uh, it's proper to really say Texas is, it's not, it's not southern like Alabama is southern. It's sort of starting to get into the west, and it's, it's a bit of a different attitude. Because of part of Texas. Uh, Texas. Yeah, Texas. exactly. Yeah, it, it has its own attitude about everything. Uh, and also, you know, Ron Paul doesn't get elected there necessarily because so many people are libertarians in his district. It's just that he delivered like half of them as, uh, as an OBGYN. I mean, he's, he's well known in the community, and so he, you know, he's a very amiable guy, and people like him. I mean, that's pretty much, and Rand Paul has been successful largely because the libertarians across the country, people who support his father, gave a lot of money to his campaign. He probably wouldn't have been able to upset, uh, what's his name? Trey Grayson, yeah, uh, without having all that money to coming in from outside the state because his father was well known among the Uh Yes, again, in the back. I, I thought well, another way to look at it, but I'm going to try and tweak you again on this, because I, I think a crack up has come. It's not coming in 2010, but it may come by 2012 or 2016. It's not based on the social issues. I agree with you on that. It's not going to cause a crack up. The um, crack up of the Republican Party? Yes, the crack up of the Republican Party, probably a conservative movement, too. It's somewhat divided there. This is not its intellectually strong point. William Buckley was their intellectual strong point. Goldwater, not Limbaugh and Beck and Hannity and these things like that. Sorry. Um, and I, I'm a talk to those, I know how stupid they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the crack up that I, the polls, what you're seeing right now in 2010 is utter devastation for the donkeys, right? They are down 10 nationwide, that is unprecedented. So I'd be very surprised they don't get massacred come this November. But that leaves us with a Republican agenda that looks kind of backwards. And if you also check the polls, this was Rasmussen, two-thirds of Republican voters would rather vote for somebody else if they could. So there's a major problem inside the, the Tea Party, especially in San Francisco, Republicans, because it's masking major Bush problems that they still can. That's why Obama's president now. now. Um, when you get to a do-nothing party, as I expect to happen in the Republicans, just like the Republican Revolution of 94, that is hardly up there with the French Revolution, right? Or the Russian or American revolutions. Nothing happens. When nothing happens again, you're looking at crack up at this point, I think, within Republican ranks alone. And you can comment on that. It's been a long time since America's seen a new party. You know, we have not seen a new party in America since. A successful one since the Republican Party. But Ross Perot got 20% of the American vote for president not that long ago. And Teddy Roosevelt, 1912, beat an incumbent Republican president. He came in second on that ballot as a progressive. So it can't happen. I know the media tells us it can never happen. It didn't happen. I, mean, I would say it's very unstable. Uh, I think it's possible. I mean, I, I definitely don't think that it's, uh, you know, either party is invincible and immune to any sort of uh, crack up like that. But I think that it's just, uh, I don't see what it would be right now, uh, what people would flock to. I mean, uh, and I, I think there is actually a good case that a lot of people are, you know, the Stokes cited polling that only, what, 2% si call themselves moderately libertarian? Well, that's not my poll. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, but that's, that was the, uh, David Bowes of a Cato Institute, I can't remember who we worked with on it, but uh, they did polling not to ask people what they identified as, but hold their actual beliefs and concluded that something like 15% of the population, 15 to 20% holds fairly libertarian beliefs. But the thing is, is that the Libertarian Party already exists and it doesn't seem that it's really taken off. Uh, so I would like that to be the, the uh, a party to take control, but I don't think that's gonna happen. Uh, but I, I think that what's more likely to happen is just that the Republican Party, the Democratic Party are going to evolve into something different. Uh, over time, but you are right. It could happen that somebody could come along, and but it has to be more than just one person. You know, that's the problem with the Perot thing, uh, is that he was just one guy, and then when they actually tried to get together and perform the reform party, it was a mess. And so, if if a movement was large enough, and they had some some charismatic leaders, not leader, uh, 
yeah, you could see uh, you could see someone come in and take a even take the presidency and then build a party on top of that. I mean, it's uh, it's possible. I don't know how likely it is. I, I don't think it's terribly likely. I'm not. A, I've never been a predictor. Never, never tried to predict. I don't think the Republican Party is going to crack up. I'm hope. I'm hopeful that it will get back to its roots of fiscal discipline, and the Tea Party is going to be a big part of getting it. That, getting that back to its roots. If it doesn't do that, I predict. I guess I predict temporary successes to be followed again by future major failures in the near future. If it doesn't get back to a, a message of fiscal discipline. One more thing. I mean, I agree with you that the Republican Revolution is not that impressive, but at the same time, like I said, as far as GDP, uh, government growth is part of, as in terms of GDP goes, it shrank under Clinton, and the government doing nothing is a lot better than doing something in most cases. <laughs> so you know that may be a, a sad place to put the bar, but. It was, they were pretty good times uh, as far as government growth goes, relatively speaking. And, you know, we ended the 90s with budget surpluses, not budget deficits that are something like 10% of GDP. So. The Clinton era wasn't dis disciplined because of the first two years of the Clinton presidency. Oh, no, I, I agree. It's, it's, it is because of, yeah, the Republicans mm -hmm. coming in, and even despite, yes, maybe even intent, uh, they. The thing is, is that they just hate each other that much. That they will not work with each other, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, we've been having this conversation for about an hour. So we will have brief closing statements. And very brief. We <laughs> okay. promise, very brief. All right. I don't know. That's what you're saying. All right. Uh, so, yeah, I, for my closing statement, I, I'll probably actually just go through some stuff that I did, was not able to get to in my opening <laughs> statement. But, uh, so, I think that we actually should, uh, libertarians should actually emphasize uh, social issues more uh, than economic issues. Given how rich we are as a country, uh, social issues should be more important because uh, the right to marry whom you choose and not to have your home ransacked and dog shot because you might enjoy a politically incorrect substance are more fundamental to liberty than the right to top marginal tax rate of 35% as opposed to 38.6%. As former uh, Sir Show Me Institute editor Tim Lee wrote last month, quote, I'm not interested in limited government as an end in itself, but as a means to greater individual liberty. I'm opposed to government programs that waste taxpayer dollars because higher taxes restrict my freedom, but I'm much more opposed to government programs that use taxpayer dollars to restrict freedom directly I'm not interested in joining a limited government movement that considers the two equivalent, and I'm definitely not interested in being part of a movement that gives torture and preemptive war a free pass under the heading of national defense, while it focuses instead on fighting the tyranny of S-chip and unemployment insurance. So, to go back to what I think needs to be done, I think we need to go out and continue educating people about libertarian ideas, and for the short run, short run political, political law dealings, we should root for the party that's out of power. So yes, this November, that means that we want to we want the Republicans to take back the House. They probably won't get the Senate, but that would be nice. And uh, I think actually the best possibility we can get is is a Democratic president, Republican Congress. So let's have the Republicans control Congress for the next 50 years and a long stream of Democrats who don't get to get anything passed because the Republicans filibuster. <laughs> I think that would just be wonderful. I was going through my notes and I realized I said everything I wanted to say. So you'll get a very brief uh, closing statement from me here. I, John's closing statement was probably the strongest thing I disagree with him about all night. The idea that fiscal issues are less important than social issues. I think uh, the 25 year old single John Payne who cares less about paying taxes and, and saving money and the like will disagree strongly with the 35-year-old John Payne with children and, and, <laughs> and, a high, and a higher income and is paying more taxes in the future. I think that's nothing against John. I think that's very natural as uh, people as people grow. I like to save money fiscally because I want, and my wife is right here with her brand new, very short haircut that she just got today. <laughs> we want to be able to save and keep more of our money so that we are not dependent on the government. 
We don't want to have. We don't want our children to be dependent on the government. We save and invest, and put money into their college fund, so they're not going to have to take the loan out to go to college. So we're not going to be dependent on the government when we when we retire. That's that's one of my overriding goals of life. Don't spend any time in prison. Don't ever be dependent. <laughs> don't ever be dependent on the government. If I can, government welfare. If I can achieve both of those things, I'll be a I'll be a happy man. Um, these, these issues are all important. I believe, I read Tim Lee's piece uh, from a few months ago. It was terrific. It was very informative. But it went well with exactly what I said in my opening statement, was that the overwhelming areas of these strong disagreement, with, with a few exceptions, but they're, of the, they're national federal issues. And if libertarians want to we're getting more active on politics at the local and state level, they find that they and conservatives, Republicans, agree on the vast majority of issues. With definitely with some exceptions, and that if libertarians, my final ending clarion call, is if libertarians get active in the conservative movement, the Republican Party, they can make that party more libertarian, which is something I want to see happen, something I fight to, to have happen. That's why I'm involved in it. So I'd love, I'd love to see that. I think that's something we can probably all agree on, is that moving the, the, one of our two major parties in a more libertarian direction, I think the Republican Party is the only party where there's a hope of that happening. If you think you can move the party of the welfare state and the Democratic Party and the party of bureaucracy in a more libertarian direction, uh, good, luck, good luck trying. <laughs> As opposed to the party of uh, tax credits and payday loan regulation and uh, development handouts and corporate welfare. I don't think any of them. Nothing you just said. <laughs> nothing you just said applies as worse to the Republican Party than the Democratic Party. Everything you just said applies worse to the Democratic Party. Everything you just said applies is a more active involved. The Democratic Party is varying degrees of worse. It's a Democrat state rep who's attempting payday loan registration. It's abuse of tax credits is worse in the big cities than than in the, the rural areas, the suburbs. There's Many horrible examples of abuse in the suburbs, which are sort of the swing area. I, 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 I think you've helped to prove my point there. Thank you. Just try to moderate. Okay, well, um, if you have any further questions for John or David, find them after this. Thank you all for coming. Is the sign-in sheet somewhere around? If you haven't signed in, please do so. We'd love to send you emails about future events like this. So thank you again for coming.